Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Shepherd, and welcome to the Doughty Street Chambers uh, webinar on antisocial behaviour, from the basics to discontinuance and something else, which I can't read at the moment. Um, we're delighted to have uh, a dream team of uh, some our youngest, brightest stars from the team, housing and social welfare team. We're starting off with Marie Paris, who's our latest uh, addition to the team as a full tenant and we're delighted that she's joined us. Uh, you'll hear a lot about her in the future, as will you hear about Alice Irving, who you will have heard of already, uh, who's speaking second, and Donna Her Green, who's coming up th at the end uh, to talk about committal, uh, which is rather appropriate. Uh, I just wanted to briefly uh, say that uh, my memories of working in housing uh, in the 80s uh, were that there wasn't such a thing as antisocial behaviour, that we used to basically, when I worked for the GLC in 1984, we didn't evict people. Uh, we used to use housing management uh, as a means of dealing with issues. Um, so housing management, uh, sorry, uh, antisocial behaviour as a concept is a relatively recent thing uh, that was introduced uh, around that time or a bit later on. And uh, it's uh, in some respects, uh, it often landlords will forego uh, the basics of housing management and go straight to court. Uh, and so that's the kind of climate that we're dealing with at the moment. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, ask Marie to start uh, the talk and, uh, and, and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much, Marie. All right. Thanks, Jim. Hi everybody, um, I'm going to be dealing with the basics, which hopefully won't be too basic for everybody. It might be a bit of a refresher for most of you, but I think the aim is to look at things that you need to be thinking about when you first get your client, when they first come in, um, maybe at the first hearing when you haven't managed to get somebody uh, counseled to represent them and maybe having to go on your own, and the directions you should be looking for to get right at the start so that you're ready in future to prepare for the trial and defend the injunction application. Um, oh, there we are, first slide. So this is the very basic, <laughs> the most basic aspect of it, but it's good to have a reminder of what the actual test is to get an injunction under the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act, um, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so there are two conditions. The first is that the court is satisfied to the civil standards, so to, on the balance of probabilities, that the respondent has engaged or threatens to engage in antisocial behaviour I think most of us know what the definition of antisocial behaviour is. It, it's, it's very broad. It includes noise nuisance, threats, of her, uh, threats, violence, harassment, that sort of stuff. Um, and the second condition is that the court considers it just and convenient to grant the injunction to prevent the respondent from engaging in antisocial behaviour. I think the two important uh, parts of that second condition is that the court has to consider it just and convenient so it's not a question of just being happy that there has been ASB. Um, there is always a sort of inherent discretion not to make an injunction and that it has to be happy that the injunction is being made to prevent further antisocial behaviour, which should be obvious, but sometimes can be forgotten, especially when allegations are very old, um, but you're still in court um, or the allegations are, yeah, are about a year old, but you've only managed to get to court at that point. Uh, if we could have the next slide. Uh, so the first thing you probably want to know is whether you're covered for it. Um, I'm going to go very briefly into the criminal side of it, which Don will cover in more detail. But in terms of your standard applications for an injunction under Section 1, um, that's going to fall into the housing category pretty, in a pretty straightforward way. Um, when you're applying for legal aid on CCMS, weirdly, the scope limitation, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but until very recently, the scope limitation is for an um, ASBO, which they don't exist anymore, but that's still the correct uh, scope limitation to apply for. If things get a bit more complicated and the landlord is applying um, for committal or, or saying that there's been a breach of the injunction, then you're in criminal territory. Um, you've got a choice there. You can either refer it to a criminal practitioner, um, which might be the best if you've never seen that client before and you don't have a live case for them or you can apply by email or through CCMS if you've got the proper access for an ICC, an individual case contract, um, which will let you have criminal legal aid um, for those proceedings only. 
So you'd have to ask for a criminal representation order. Um, generally speaking, that's only a good idea um, if, you, if there are already possession proceedings or there are imminent possession proceedings, in which case it's a good idea for that all to be dealt with uh, by one firm. And Don will go into more detail about that. Next slide, please. There we are. Um, so the first thing to think about is without notice applications. I think the important thing to remember um, is that the usual rules apply when it comes to ASBEs, um, when it comes to without notice applications. So we've had a reminder of that recently with the case of Southern Housing Group and Berry and Berry, which is actually Alice's case, which is at the Clark and Well County Court. But there's, there's authority for that point, which is Birmingham City Council and ASFA. So that's the High Court saying it's very much the case that applications for antisocial behavior, the usual rules for without notice applications apply. So the first is that the applicant should be giving full and frank disclosure. So they're under a duty to give full and frank disclosure. That includes disclosure of all the material facts. Very importantly, those material facts should normally include whether the tenant has any sort of vulnerability or disability and, and whether there are any counter allegations either against the complainant or well, yeah, generally against the complainant, or if there are other neighbours that have had no complaints about the person that they're seeking an injunction against. You also have to draw attention to adverse evidence and arguments um, that, you know, that's only to the extent that it's reasonable, but you do need to bring the court's attention to points that lie against your favour. And there's a duty to make reasonable inquiry as well. So it's not good enough, I think, for a landlord, especially a social landlord, to come to court and say, as far as we know, nobody's disabled. And as far as we know, there's no disability if they've not really checked at all, especially with social landlords, because there's a good reason to think that somebody probably might have a vulnerability or a disability. Um, th this rule applies though. I've never seen it actually uh, be complied with. There's a duty to make a note of the without notice hearing and serve it on the defendant. So that's very important. Um, it's meant to be a note to say, these are the things that I covered at the hearing. Um, and that gives you the opportunity as a defendant to say, well, you haven't actually complied with the duty in full and frank disclosure because you've left out A, B, and C. Um, if an interim order is made, it should only be the minimum required to prevent harm. Um, so oftentimes without notice applications are A, made routinely, and B, they are looking for every single term of the injunction that they would be applying for at the final stage. That shouldn't be what's going on. The court should only grant and really the, the landlord should only apply for terms that are necessary to prevent harm. So terms about noise nuisance, things like this, unless it's really <laughs> disastrous levels of noise that are very, very upsetting, shouldn't really feature in a without notice application. And finally, you need to be thinking about whether the hearing needed to be without notice at all. So in Alice's case in Southern Housing Group, I think it was the case that the, land, the court decided, well, there was no need for this to be without notice because the landlord knew about this for months. And I think that happens all the time. Um, without notice doesn't mean I forgot to apply. So we now, <laughs> I forgot to apply in good time. So now we need to go without notice. That's not a good, not good enough reason to make a without notice application. Um, and if you get the case after there's been a without notice application and you see that any of these rules haven't been complied with, there's a good chance that you can get that um, injunction discharged and you should apply to do so and you'll get your costs. So I think it, it's a good idea to be brave with this stuff because the courts just let it slide and they really shouldn't. Next slide, please. Um, once you're over that hurdle, or you know maybe there wasn't a without notice application at all, um, the next thing you need to be thinking about is what directions you're asking for. So um, ASBEs are made under part eight, but not all of the part eight rules apply. So um, CPR 65 is where you see all the rules about ASBIs really, um, and it excludes certain things that apply to part eight. Um, most importantly, there's no need for the defendant to file an acknowledgement of service or to file his evidence in response alongside that acknowledgement of service. So if there's no filing of an acknowledgement of service or of anything really, the defendant or the respondent still has every right to participate in the next hearing. Um, if it does continue to proceed under part eight, the defendant can only put in evidence in reply. So they don't have an opportunity to put in a defense or a counterclaim. So the first thing you have to think about is whether it's a good idea to ask the court to move this into part seven. And I think that's gonna be particularly appropriate where you have like a full 
formal legal defense that you want to put in. And normally that's going to be when you have um, disability arguments to run or where there are ongoing possession proceedings and it just makes more sense for those to be dealt with together. Um, that way it's put onto part seven, which is the standard track and you're able to ask for your usual directions and it's possible and it's likely that it'll be moved onto the multi-track as well. If you think that, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward, it's a factual dispute and you're happy for it to stay in part eight, I still think it's a good idea for you to ask for standard disclosure and uh, for the allegations to be put in a Scott schedule and that just helps you control the situation where the landlord puts in a hundred allegations which, which are just disproportionate to respond to. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to put in evidence in response. Um, sometimes a landlord will say, uh, there's no need for standard disclosure. This is a really simple case. Um, we'll just disclose the housing file and then we'll proceed as normal. You can put in a witness statement and then on we go to trial. I think it's a good idea to push for standard disclosure then because what you might miss out on the housing file, which is really just about your tenant in particular, is all the information about the complainant. Um, so when you're asking for standard disclosure, make sure um, that you're requesting the information about the neighbours around them and what you're looking for really is, especially in a case where, you're, where your tenant is saying, well, actually it's the neighbor that's causing all the noise. You're looking for allegations against that neighbor. Um, next, please. Um, at your first hearing or any interim hearing, the court has the power to grant an interim injunction um, if it considers it just to do so, that's under section seven. Again, there's a discretion to do it. They don't have to do it. Um, and landlords will often apply for it. Um, just as a matter of course. Um, the more stringent the terms they're seeking, the more likely it is that the balance of convenience is gonna lie with the defendant. Um, so if they're looking to um, exclude the tenant or if they're looking for you know, very stringent injunctive terms, so maybe excluding visitors to the property, um, then you can argue that you know, the balance of convenience doesn't lie with the landlord there because there's a, there's a big risk of injustice. Um, if the allegations are extremely serious though, and sometimes, you know, the first thing you see, are, you know, risk of violence, um, threats against neighbors, um, neighbors are really quite seriously frightened, then um, you kind of have to make a judgment call. And it's normally a good idea to think about offering an undertaking at these hearings or offering down a pared down interim order. So an order that doesn't carry powers of arrest, doesn't exclude and has tighter terms. Obviously, that's only an option if you don't have concerns about your client's capacity and capacity will be covered by Alice later. Um, I think it's a good idea, though, it should be fairly obvious to make clear on the face of the order that um, if an interim injunction is made, the courts made no finding of facts. They're just making the interim order because Section 7 is satisfied. Next slide, please. A um, bit more detail about powers of arrest and exclusion. Again, it's something that landlords often ask for as a matter of course, um, as soon as they apply for an injunction and they really shouldn't be something that the court should be granting at, at will. Um, neither should be treated as routine. The test for both is in section four and section 13 of the act. Um, generally speaking, it's only available when there is use or threatened use of violence alleged, or there's a significant risk of harm. Significant risk of harm is broad and it includes psychological harm, but it also exists on a scale. So the court has to be sort of sensible about the sort of harm they think would reach the threshold for powers of arrest or exclusion to be included. And again, um, it, it may be obvious, but it's it, the statute says may, it's a discretion. There's no need um, for the court to make um, an order with powers of arrest or excluding the tenant even if they think there is you know, use or threatened use of violence. In terms of powers of arrest, um, I think you should be arguing that powers of arrest should only really be used um, where there's um, you know, in extreme situations, such as persistent re breach of court orders, or even just a history of someone who doesn't, doesn't comply with court orders, maybe if they've breached bail conditions in the recent past. Um, and also it's, it's particularly inappropriate and not necessary where the events that are justifying its inclusion. Um, so the reason that they're asking for it are from donkeys years ago. <laughs> so if they're saying that they need powers of arrest because um, your tenant did something two years ago, 
then that's really not good enough. Um, and the two cases cited there, Lewis and Lewis and Horner and Horner are from the family court, but I, I think they apply here and you can make the argument that they apply. Uh, in terms of ex exclusion, uh, the revised guidance for the Act states that it's not expected that the power of exclusion will be used often and that applications for exclusion from the home should only be made in extreme cases and the court should pay special attention to issues of proportionality. Now that's for obvious reasons. Um, so I think that makes clear that even when disability is not at play, um, you have to be looking at proportionality and you have to be looking at things the landlord could have done uh, short of excluding the tenant, which is an extreme thing to do. I think you can definitely make the argument that they need to be looking for alternative accommodation if they're asking for an excluding order, especially at a first hearing. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the evidence that the landlord needs to bring uh, to get an injunction, I mean, this is a, a common grievance, I think, with most practitioners, is that there, there's just really some shocking quality of evidence that's relied on. And it's because the courts have let landlords rely on it, really. Um, the, the position is that hearsay is, generally speaking, admissible. Um, but the court should pay attention to factors set out in Section 4 of the Civil Evidence Act before deciding how much weight to apply that hearsay. And if they don't do that and they don't make very clear that they've paid attention to those factors, then they may face an appeal. So the case there is Moat Housing Group um, versus um, Harris, which made clear that you can be appealed if you're not looking, if you're not paying sufficient attention to these factors before taking account of any number of hearsay witness statements that the court gets in these sorts of cases. Um, so things to look out for, which you can really uh, point out to the court, you should be giving minimal weight to. Uh, anonymous hearsay, um, we see it all the time. So there's very little you can do sometimes because the, the landlord will just say, well, the neighbors are frightened. I think you should be asking for a bit more details to why it needed to be anonymous. They need to be giving reasons for why they're frightened. I've seen it in cases where the only thing that's being alleged is noise nuisance. Uh, there's no reason there for them to be frightened of their neighbor, sufficient for them to, to not sign their own witness statement. Um, you have to look out for multiple hearsay. I think that happens quite often. A housing officer will hear from a neighbor who actually heard from a neighbor. <laughs> um, in those situations, you need to be pointing out to the court that this is just not reliable evidence. It's not evidence that they should be paying too much attention to. Um, again, the other things you need to look for, lack of an explanation of where the hearsay came from. So sometimes a landlord will just say, well, we got reports. There's nothing stopping them, even if the tenant is very frightened, uh, the neighbor is very frightened. There's nothing stopping them from showing redacted emails or just showing their complaint system, their complaint logs, show, telling you who recorded it, how it was recorded. And these are all things that will help the court to decide how much weight to put on it. And if they're just not aware of it, then you should be saying that minimal weight should be put because there's too many question marks. Um, another thing to look out for is whether the source, if you know the source of the hearsay, um, had any reason to mislead the court and whether there's any good reason why the evidence could not have been given directly. So reasons why um, a neighbour might want to mislead the court, though it's something that you should be cautious about implying. Um, if it's an ongoing neighbour dispute and it's just one neighbour, there's one reason. <laughs> um, Sometimes somebody, somebody, people want to move. That's one reason. Sometimes it's just it's just gossip that's gone out of hand in, in you know in social housing that happens sometimes. Um, and lastly, the thing to look out for is very poorly particularized allegations. So it's it's not good enough, and you see it all the time that the landlord says, "Well, my tenant, this tenant is just generally a nuisance," or as we like, we always see a known drug user. <laughs> um, they need to allege that something happened on a specific day, hopefully at a specific time. The standard of proof is, is lower, it's a balance of probabilities, but the court still needs to decide that something did happen, not just that a tenant was generally a nuisance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this I think is, is probably very basic and <laughs> most people already know, but something that's good to be reminded of. Um, right at the start, you should be thinking about settling these sorts of cases often and where you can make admissions. So that doesn't mean um, admit to everything. It only means being sensible about the stuff that you can actually resist. Um, it's very, very difficult to defend these cases where the, uh, the tenant has denied every single allegation because most of the time, at least one of them will stick. 
um, and it makes it look like they have absolutely no insight into their own behavior. So the court's gonna have a hard time giving them a second chance because they don't think that they've got any hope of actually complying with an undertaking or even a sort of more friendly injunction. Again, if capacity is not an issue, and Alice will cover that in a bit more detail, but if capacity, if you're satisfied about their capacity, you can consider making an open offer of an undertaking. So that's just a, a promise to the court. The terms can mirror the injunction. And the, the beauty of it being open is that you're saying to the court, look, we've made this offer. My tenant wants to comply, wants to make a promise to the court and the landlord is being really unreasonable. And the reason they're being unreasonable is normally because they want to use it as a ground for possession. But you're just making it clear to the court that there are other options available. Um, if the allegations are too serious for an undertaking to be realistic, um, then again, you can do the same thing, but with an injunction, again, looking at less adverse terms. So letting them stay in the property. Um, so no exclusion, no powers of arrest, or with, again, with tighter terms. So maybe they can have visitors, but they can't have visitors at certain hours, that sort of thing. Um, you can try and include recitals if you're gonna settle. You can try and include recitals about steps that a landlord should take before they try to restore the proceedings or apply for breach. Um, that's especially useful if you have a disabled client. And if the other side doesn't agree to those recitals, then there's nothing stopping you from making, um, for asking for the same steps to be taken, but framing that as a request for reasonable adjustments. Make sure that's in writing. And then you can raise that if ever this, the application comes back to court or there's an application for committal. Next slide, please. Uh, practical tips. Um, firstly, get the policies. So again, most of the social landlords will have something in their policy saying that an injunction or court proceedings of any nature should be a last resort um, and that they should have tried other things. Other things are usually uh, acceptable behavior contract. If somebody's disabled or otherwise vulnerable, maybe a referral to social services if it's, if it's relevant. And if they're asking to exclude someone from the property, then again, a referral to social services or to the housing department and some attempt to find alternative accommodation. If you have that in a policy, then it makes that argument even more compelling once you get to trial. Um, again, ask for disclosure of any complaints made against the complainants, um, whether those complaints are by your client or by other neighbors in the area. Consider the layout of the client's building. So if you hear from your client that they think most of the allegations are coming from one neighbor that's next to them, have a think about whether there's another neighbor on the same floor or maybe there's a neighbor directly below them that they might be on good terms with. It may be that you're able to get a witness statement from them to say, I've actually not had any problems. And then it, it changes the whole narrative for once you get to your trial. <laughs> this is really obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people maybe don't think about it. Um, and then it's too late once by the time you're at a trial. But if it's noise nuisance that's being alleged and you're in one of these properties that's really poorly insulated, do all that you can to try and reduce that just by taking practical steps. So lay down carpets, maybe put in some curtains if you can manage that. Um, get rid of your massive stereo, that sort of stuff. And then it's just much, much better if you do that right at the start than rather than a day before the trial or at the trial you promise to do it because it's, it's less convincing for obvious reasons. Similarly, if the building has poor sound insulation, um, consider instructing a sound insulation engineer. So you can, you can ask that as part of your directions. Um, listen, if there's, if there's tons of noise and it's really unbearable to live there, then the fact that the property is poorly sound insulated may not get you very far. But if it's the case that, you know, the, the, the landlord has brought video record or oh, audio recordings of conversations that you can hear really crisply, then you can start to argue, look, they're just, they're behaving in a tenant like manner they're having conversations in their property. Um, you can't injunct against that. Um, it's, it's not reasonable. It's not just and convenient to make an injunction if the, the actual fault lands with the landlord. Uh, next slide. That's me, uh, on to Alice. Fantastic, Marie, thank you so much. Um, I believe I've just turned my video on and off again a number of times. Can you see and hear me now? Um, thumbs up from Marie if you can see and hear me clearly. I can. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, so I'm going to touch on a couple of um, discrete points that often arise in the context of antisocial behaviour injunctions. And Marie mentioned a number of times the issue of capacity. 
and I'm sure that um, in your experience as well as mine, a, a high proportion of cases in which um, an antisocial behaviour injunction is being sought, there are question marks around the capacity of the client um, involved. And so it's really important to be um, very alert to those and to be aware of both your ethical obligations, but also the law. So it is the case that as a legal um, representative, if you have any concerns or question marks about a client's capacity, it's necessary for you to explore that. And um, if those persist, to put those before the court. Um, normally what that will look like is um, getting an expert report and then moving things forward. Um, sometimes you'll have a client who won't um, agree to be assessed and obviously you can't force them to be assessed. And that, that raises um, difficult questions, but it's not, um, it's not appropriate for you to just continue to proceed as if you didn't have doubts about capacity in those circumstances. It might be necessary um, to instead, for example, apply for the matter to be determined at court um, with your client being able to give evidence to the court and then the court making a final determination. But that's all very fact sensitive. I just wanted to flag at the outset that there are really um, important ethical, ethical obligations here and um, it's not something that can, um, can be ignored. So if I could have the first slide, please. So I'm just going to do a bit of a whirlwind. Um, and again, I'm really sorry. I'm sure that this is something that you're all very familiar with. I hope that some of the pointers um, will we'll give you a little bit more than the sort of normal framework, but I think it's important to start from the beginning. So um, capacity, the Mental Capacity Act 2005, the very first section sets out a number of really important principles. The first is obviously that um, for adults, there's a presumption of capacity um, unless it's proven that the person lacks capacity. So um, that onus has to be sort of discharged. A person has to be found to lack capacity before. Um, it's found um, that they're not allowed to conduct proceedings, for example, in their own name. Um, the, the second point, and when we come to the test for capacity, you'll see that the core of that is the ability of a person to make decisions. And um, when you're deciding if they're able to or not, it's not enough just to say, well, I talked at them in legalese for 20 minutes and they didn't understand me and didn't seem to be able to, to determine what to do, therefore they lack capacity. Um, you've got to really think about reasonable adjustments that an individual might be able to um, have in place um, that would enable them to make decisions. So if you have a client where you think they're maybe on the borderline, when you're instructing the expert um, to, to look at their capacity, you might expressly be asking them about, well, what measures do you think could be taken to improve um, the possibility of this person being able to make decisions? Um, if we put these in place, do you think they could make decisions um, just to make sure that you've covered off um, that kind of aspect of capacity? Um, and the final um, part of section one that is often relied on is actually quite frustrating, but I'll, I'll talk in, in due course about a case that I think can counteract that sometimes. Um, I think this is over relied on. So a person's not to be treated as unable to make a decision merely because they make an unwise decision. So, you know, a person who's um, completely mentally well, doesn't have any kind of um, brain injury, might make terrible decisions. And we wouldn't sort of question that they have capacity, we would, we would just say they were unwise. And in the same way, um, a person where there are doubts about their capacity, we shouldn't assume they lack capacity just because they make terrible decisions. I think that can be a bit difficult sometimes where you have a person who kind of understands everything that's going on, but has maybe um, some kind of obsessive, kind of compulsive um, presentation because of a mental health issue where something shades from being a lack of capacity into bad decision makings can be a bit uh, vague and, and I'll come on to a case I think that can be helpful um, and then just teasing that out with your expert evidence. Could I have the next slide please? Okay so the core test for capacity is section 21 and I would always set this out verbatim in a letter of instruction to an expert. So um, the, what's really important here is that a person's capacity relates to a particular matter and at a particular time. So um, you have judges sometimes who really don't understand capacity I've had a judge say to me, well, how can your client lack capacity because she can look after her children? I mean, those are completely separate questions. The question whether a person has capacity to litigate or capacity to comply with an injunction, those are very specific to the specific issue, the particular matter in question, and a person's ability um, to make decisions can flux over time. So a person may have capacity at one moment, but then perhaps have a relapse in a mental health condition and lack capacity. So it is really important to think about making sure that when you obtain evidence from an expert, you're very specific about what, you're not just saying, do they have capacity generally, because that's not a meaningful question in a legal kind of sense. You need to say, do they have capacity to do X? Do they have capacity to do Y? Um, so if we can move on to the next slide, I'm gonna start talking 
sort of eventually more specifically about the forms of kind of capacity you'll be interested in in these types of cases. Um, so in teasing out that idea about what is it that means a person isn't able to make a decision. So a person doesn't have capacity if they're unable to make a decision about a particular matter at a particular time. These are the kind of things that might go wrong, which means they're unable to make a decision. Um, so they can't understand the information that's relevant. They can't retain that information, although the legislation makes clear that if you can retain information very briefly, that can be good enough. It doesn't need to be something that's a long term memory. You can't use away that information um, in order to make a decision or you can't communicate that decision. Um, most of the time with ASB cases, I think this is likely to fall in category C, subsection C, where the person can often understand um, that their neighbours are complaining about them and it's in relation to particular conduct and that it's a serious allegation and they can understand that, you know, an injunction is being sought and the effect of that might be X, Y, Z, but they might have difficulty um, kind of making decisions um, based on all of that information, using and weighing that information. So. I think that's often, um, it's often going to fall into C when you're talking about capacity to litigate. I'll come on to the next slide and start talking about that. Um, I'm ahead of myself. I always think I've got one less slide than I have. Here is a useful summary I prepared of um, capacity in general. So you're always looking for, um, when you look at that test that I brushed over very, very quickly, because I'm sure you're aware of this, you're, you've got to make sure you cover off all of these things when you have expert evidence. So you need your expert to say whether there's an impairment or disturbance of the functioning of the mind or brain. Often that will be a finding, for example, of um, a mental health problem more often than not in this context. Um, but it might also be, for example, an acquired brain injury or, or a learning disability. Um, then you've got to show that there is an inability to understand, which is what we were talking about um, just a second ago. And then importantly, you need to show that there's a connection between the impairment or disturbance and that inability to understand and to make decisions. So again, I just um, think you want to be really careful in crafting your letter of instruction to make sure that you're teasing out all of these necessary elements. It can be quite easy to kind of gloss over, particularly when somebody is quite floridly psychotic or fairly obviously unwell, to not actually get the expert to nail down what the impairment or disturbance is and you just want to make sure that you're systematic and drawing that out so that you know when when you get to court you can be very clear about um, how each of the elements of the test um, in relation to capacity are or are not satisfied. Okay next slide we're finally on to um, long promise slide on capacity to litigate specifically. So it, I think it's important in these cases we can rush quite quickly in ASB cases to say okay well the main question is whether they have capacity to comply with the injunction at all. But there is an important prior question, which is, do they have capacity to give you instructions? Can they litigate? Um, and a couple of authorities that are important in this context, the first Dunhill and Bergen, um, this was a case where the, the um, litigant was able to make a simple decision in terms of seeking advice from a solicitor. But then um, when the, the legal um, representatives came back and said, oh, we've got this kind of quite complicated case um, theory or strategy that we think would be best for you that was too complicated for her to be able to understand and to make a decision about um, and on that basis they said she lacked capacity so you're going to be looking at the overarching case and the ability of the person to to see the whole case through not just to make for example the immediate decision before them which might be more simple than the overarching kind of case strategy that is being engaged in um, Bailey and Warren I think is most commonly used and I would always have this in my letter of instruction um, it is that they set out some of the matters that are relevant to whether somebody has capacity to, lit to litigate. So the things that they need to um, be able to understand um, include the chance of success, um, their ability to give proper instructions, and in particular, their ability to have insight into a compromise, um, to be able to ask and instruct solicitors to advise on a possible compromise, and then to understand and weigh advice about a potential compromise. I think it's really important that a client needs to understand, um, you know, basically the various routes that a case might take and the prospects of each of those and to be able to make an informed decision and that's basically what Bailey and Warren is drawing out. If I could have the next slide please. So this was a case that Dan Clark on our team actually recently um, turned up when he was he's working on a fairly complex case with capacity at the moment and I thought this was really helpful um, I might just give you a, a quiet moment without me talking to read the quote rather than me reading it out to you. <laughs> 
So I think that this case is useful to counteract sometimes the tendency of courts to read that section one um, provision I drew out earlier, which says a person just because they make an unwise decision doesn't mean they lack capacity. Sometimes courts can then get nervous about finding somebody who has sort of a phobia or obsessive thoughts or compulsive behavior lacks capacity because they go, well, they understand what they're doing um, and they're just making a bad decision. Therefore, they still have capacity. I think Lindsay and Wood cast some really useful light on that to say that, you know, this is still an area where you should be really thinking quite seriously about whether the person has an, um, capacity or not. And again, this is a useful quote, I think, for a letter of instruction, just to help um, your expert understand where the law is at in relation to how these different things um, kind of link together. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, in contrast to that, we've got capacity to comply with an injunction, which is obviously really, really important in these cases. So you've, you've looked at, first of all, and I would say whenever you have doubt about capacity, you've got an ethical obligation to, to, to determine whether or not the person has capacity to litigate and hopefully they will agree to be assessed. Um, and then at the same time, you're probably going to be wanting to look at whether they have capacity to comply with an injunction. And the reason that's really important, and I'm sure you're all more than familiar with this is obviously the Wookiee case which basically said the court will not make an injunction in vain. They make an injunction in relation to a person who can't understand that injunction or for whatever reason can't comply with it. Then when it comes to enforce the injunction, a court will just throw it out and say, well, we can't hold a person to account. We can't punish a person for not complying with an injunction where they didn't understand it or they couldn't have acted otherwise. So that's the underpinning kind of philosophy of Wookiee and Wookiee. A court won't make an injunction that can't be enforced. So um, when we tease out what that means, they effectively are saying court do not make an injunction if the defendant can't understand the terms of the injunction. So if they can't understand the terms, you can't hold them to it. Um, they also talk about whether or not the person is able to understand what he's doing. I think it's, I've never really seen a case where this has come up, but I, I think that's kind of, sometimes people are sufficiently psychotic that they don't understand that when they're doing an act such as banging on a wall, that that's actually what they're doing. They might be think that they're doing something, something else like hitting a demon or something, but I've never seen that really come through in practice. Um, the third is whether or not they understand it's wrong to breach the injunction. Um, so you've got these kind of quite subtle distinctions coming out in Wookiee because they're talking about incapable of understanding what they're doing and that it's wrong. Um, but again, I would normally set this out in, in a degree of detail in my letter of instruction to try to make sure I really get the kind of as clear uh, response as possible because in, in my experience, it, it, you can get sometimes reports that uh, lack, lack a degree of clarity that you would hope for in making submissions. And so I think if you can set up your questions as clearly as possible and delineate, you know, can they understand the terms? Do they understand it's wrong? All of these things separately, then you've got a good better chance of getting evidence that's really useful. If I could have the next slide. The next really important case as well to add to Wookiee, and I think you've got to be really aware that it's not just Wookiee, is, is Pender. So it might be a case that you've got someone who's completely capable of understanding the injunction, um, understanding what they're doing, understanding that it would be wrong to breach the injunction, but they've got a, some kind of compulsion or obsession, which means that they actually just can't comply with the terms, even if they wanted to. And Pender is the authority that says that no injunction should be made in those circumstances. Now, this is tricky, and I think this is where again, really good evidence is important. So Wookiee itself makes the point that we won't normally, like a court won't normally refuse an injunction just because a defendant is likely to breach it. So it's probably not gonna be enough if your expert says, well, it's probably, he probably won't be able to comply. You're really looking for very clear evidence that it's not possible. And again, I think the way you frame your question can help, um, you know, again, obviously you can't lead your expert in any way, but if you set out the, the case um, law, clearly and then form a neutral question, I think often a, an astute expert will recognize that what they need is, um, you know, to, to make a decision as to whether or not they can or cannot comply rather than to say something on a, a sort of a probabilities range, which is not really of any use to you. If they come back and say 90% chance he's not going to comply, PEN is probably not going to apply for you and you can't use it. So the key question there is, can the defendant comply with the terms of the injunction? Um, next slide, please. Now, this might seem a bit weird in the middle of all of this, um, but while I was on capacity, I thought I would touch very briefly on the capacity of an individual to make a homelessness application. And the reason I've done that is because in my experience, 
often when you have a case where somebody lacks capacity and it's as be as brought you get the antisocial behavior injunction application knocked out on the basis that an injunction shouldn't be made because they don't have capacity to comply with the injunction. The next step that might be taken is a possession claim is brought on the basis of the antisocial behavior. And at that point, um, obviously there, there aren't the same kind of questions about ability to comply with an injunction. you will be looking instead at possible defenses. And you might also be thinking practically about, you know, if I have a very mentally unwell client who potentially doesn't actually have high prospects of being able to manage their current tenancy, should they in fact be looking um, to, to move into alternative accommodation that might be more suitable for them. And at that point, if you've got concerns about their capacity, you also need to be thinking about whether they in fact have capacity to make a homelessness application. Um, and so the authority for that is the WB case. And that just sets out what the test is to determine whether a person has capacity to make a homelessness application. And that's whether they're able to make decisions about where they should live and also um, make a decision about entering a tenancy agreement. And that means they have to be able to understand the terms and they need to be able to comply with the terms of a tenancy agreement. So that's just um, in there as part of the toolkit because I think it's wrong to look at antisocial behaviour cases generally in isolation. Um, because there's often a huge number of different things going on. I'm just mindful of time, so I'm going to keep cracking on. Um, I think I've carried, um, covered a lot of this as I went. Um, you've got to set out the law, and I, a lot of what I've got on these slides is actually what I put in letters of instruction, so the, the kind of basics from the Mental Capacity Act and then the key authorities that kind of tease out precisely what those things mean. You obviously need enough of a summary of the factual background and the legal proceedings for the, the expert to understand, you know, so if you think there might be a disability defence that could be run, you might want to very briefly summarise that and say, well, that's something that I'd need to be able to understand in a way. Um, be very careful to be neutral in this because um, it, it may be that a letter of instruction could be um, ordered to be produced later in proceedings. So you just, you know, and obviously just from an ethics perspective, you, you don't want to be spinning the facts anything other than neutrally when instructing an expert. Um, I think I said earlier, be really careful to make sure you're not just asking very general questions about capacity and, and really differentiate. So you get a clear finding about capacity to litigate and then a separate clear finding about compliance with an injunction. And as I said, make sure you're getting them to address all of the elements of the kind of law I've set out, including that there's a causal connection between one of the mental impairment or disturbances and the ability or inability of the person to make a decision. Okay, crack on. So um, covered this as well. Um, if a person lacks capacity to litigate, then they'll need a litigation friend. Um, there is specific provision in the CPR, I'm sure that you're aware of, which says protected party um, needs a litigation friend, otherwise steps can't be taken in, in the proceedings. Um, more often than not, these cases kind of fall away because you find a lack of capacity to comply with the injunction. And at that point, you can sort of invite the defendant to discontinue on the basis of the expert evidence um, because they're not going to succeed. Um, more often than not that works and they say okay you know we're going to stop but as I say they then start preparing plan b which is often a potential possession claim um do be aware that you should still seek your costs on discontinuation if the defendant backs down because um they can sometimes say well we didn't know or you know on the information we had it was reasonable for us to issue that's not the test <laughs> the test in terms of costs and discontinuation is that the starting point is you get your cost as the defendant if they discontinue and they have to show some specific reason to depart from that and as far as I'm concerned with those cases without going into a lot of detail on this um, if you've got someone who's engaging in behavior of the sort and you've probably got some minimal notice that they might be mentally unwell you run the risk when you litigate of a potential finding that they lack capacity such that the case falls away so um, I do push for costs and discontinuation in this context and don't be fobbed off by arguments that it was reasonable for them to issue because that's not the correct legal test for determining costs okay um if we can move on so I'm going to do this really fast because we've done a lot of training in chambers around um, the Equality Act. And I am also just running out of time and need to hand the baton to Don. Um, I think the most useful likely defense, if, you, if you've got a case that hasn't fallen away because of capacity, but the person does have say a mental health condition or a learning disability or something else, is um, a section 15 argument that, um, that the pursuit of an antisocial behavior injunction is discrimination arising from disability. 
and this is uh, section 15. So a person, um, a landlord would be treating your client unfavorably, so the unfavorable treatment is seeking an ASB, because of something arising in consequence of their disability. So that's the really important thing. You need to identify each of the elements. So what is the thing arising that's led to the application for an ASB? And is that in consequence of your client's disability? And obviously you need evidence that they've got a disability in the first place. And the definition of disability is in section six. And again, I'd always set that out in full in a letter to an expert. And then also you need to show that basically it's disproportionate for them to be applying for an ASB. And the kind of things that Marie pointed to earlier, if they've not gone for an acceptable behaviour contract, if they've not referred to social services, all of that kind of stuff then comes into the picture and their policies are also relevant in arguing whether or not they've done um, something that's proportionate in pursuing an ASB. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is a whirlwind tour of what that causal connection needs to look like when you talk about something arising in consequence of a person's disability. I think what's really important is that it doesn't need to be the only cause, it can be an effective cause. And my favorite case for use on this point, and again, I always put this in instructions is the RISB case, the bottom there. Very briefly, that was a case where the claimant was a wheelchair user, and my apologies, it should be in the um, Employment Appeal Tribunal there, I've got a typo, but he was a wheelchair user and um, he was fired um, from his job because he, um, got into a racist and angry tirade at a colleague. Um, the reason that that had happened was because he went to a event and there was no wheelchair, wheelchair accessibility. Now it was common ground that the fact he had a short temper and had some racist attitudes had nothing to do with his disability. But it was the fact that there was no wheelchair accessibility to this venue and there should have been that had triggered his tirade. And the court found that, that, that therefore his disability was an effective cause amongst a number of other causes, including his short temper and um, as such section 15 applied. So it's a really useful case when there might be a bunch of conflating factors in a person's life um, where the other side is saying, hey, it's not really his disability, he's just not a nice guy or it's his drug use. You can say, well, actually it only needs to be one, of, one factor amongst many. It doesn't even need to be the main cause for section 15 to be engaged. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, when you're instructing an expert in relation to a disability discrimination, defense. Now, normally you wouldn't get this done at the same time as um, your instruction ab about capacity because you don't have, you know, until you've determined if somebody has capacity, you can't, you don't have instructions to have a person assessed as whether they have disability or not. But it's going to depend. So if your client is happy to be assessed for everything, including whether they have a disability defense and they agree to that, then I think you're ethically okay to do that all in one go, which is obviously efficient with that first letter of instruction to your expert. If your client is not willing to agree to be assessed in terms of a disability discrimination defense, when you're having them assess for capacity, then you shouldn't include it in the letter because you have to decide whether or not the capacity issue, you know, which way that falls first. Um, although you might send a second letter of instruction to the expert, basically explain that you may come back to them in the future to ask them the following questions and could they please bear that in mind when they carry out the assessment and that could set them up to be someone who can provide um, the answer to those questions for example if the official solicitor is later instructed you then go back to the expert and they don't need to reassess your client and that can be um, practical. The other things you want to be looking at there are um, also thinking about proportionality when you're talking about, well, is it proportionate for them to pursue an ASB or is it proportionate for them, for example, to go down the possession proceeding route, which might be what's backing this up, it might come. You might want to be thinking about the impact on the client. You might want to be thinking about, well, what other things could have been done? What support or treatment might they be able to get? Again, if you think it's going to go the possession route, you might want to cover up, cover off whether the current accommodation is suitable and, and also that issue of capacity to make a homelessness application. It's obviously going to be really context specific how much of this you need to cover off in any given case, but it can be quite good to cover as much as you can if you're feeling quite um, certain that something's going to turn into a possession case, for example, where allegations are quite serious. Okay, next slide. I am done and I have to apologize um, to Don for leaving him a very brief amount of time, but I do hope that that was helpful and I, I will um, stop speaking now and pass the bit on. Hello, um, everyone. Thanks, Alice and Marie, for that really comprehensive overview of everything. Um, 
I don't want to <laughs> rush too much, but I know that we all we have other places to be. Um, or if you're like me, you're already in your bedroom. Um, so uh, next slide, please. I'm going to talk about committal proceedings. Um, this is a brief uh, overview of what I'm going to be touching on. Um, they can be, they can really uh, oscillate between really straightforward and being really complicated. And it's really good to know all the detail if you can. Um, hopefully all the references that I provide will be able to be a decent springboard for you um, to look at various provisions and various other aspects that come up in committal proceedings quite a lot. And um, if not, feel free to email me if there's anything unclear and uh, I'm sure Alice and Marie have provided similar stuff. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of give you a brief overview about this because it's a quite unusual thing that this county court does sending people to prison. Um, and because it's such an exceptional thing that they do in this context, um, that the procedures should be followed really rigorously. Now, as um, Marie and Alice already touched on, it's not always uh, done with the kind of highest standards of procedural propriety. Um, so I'll try and give you as much ammunition as it were um, to look at how to do this as well as possible. Um, so first of all, uh, next slide, please. What are committal proceedings? Um, in effect, they are, an, uh, uh, they are contempt of court. If an order has not been complied with, um, it's contempt of court, and that is the same for an antisocial behaviour injunction. There are civil injunctions made by the court, and if you fail to comply with them, the court takes it seriously um, as contempt of court. Um, how committal proceedings start are that there will be an antisocial behaviour injunction, uh, evidently, um, and it depends on whether there's a power of arrest or not. Um, Marie's already touched on the circumstances in which a power of arrest arises, uh, and so that gives a direct route for someone to be brought before the court using section nine, the police can arrest an individual for a breach of an injunction. Um, and often this will be the case where um, maybe te other tenants in the property know about this or other individuals know about um, his or her behavior and will call the police and the police can arrest on the basis of the injunction. Um, alternatively, uh, the landlord uh, can apply for a warrant for arrest. Um, and this is, in effect, an application um, for the individual to be arrested uh, and is an application and under the normal procedure under Part uh, 23 of the Civil Procedure Rules, um, as well as 65.46, which deals with specifically under the 2014 Act, which is the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act. But there are really, really strict um, requirements that should be complied with. Now, I'm not going to read them all out because they number all the way up to S because they're letters. Um, but it is things like the application needs to include the nature of the alleged breach and um, the dates of this. Uh, it should include a penal notice as well, the date and times, um, the brief summary of the facts. Um, it needs to include information about their right to be legally represented. Um, that the hearing will be in public, all those kind of factors, and they're listed and enumerated in 80, Rule 81.4. And that is a must to comply with unless the court orders otherwise, or it's wholly inappropriate. So these ought to be quite high standards that mean that the court shouldn't waive it um, and should consider not uh, allowing the application in such circumstances where the proper procedure hasn't been complied with. Now, there's been scope for flexibility about this rule, and inevitably there always is um, in these situations where it's not, uh, the procedural proprietary is not upheld. And often the consideration would be whether there's injustice to the defendant um, will arise if the proper procedure was not followed. Um, just on a very practical note, um, the hearings will be quote unquote in public, and the and council will have to be robed. Um, you can obviously apply to to do away with this if you don't have access to it or whatever the circumstances are. Um, but it's it shows the kind of seriousness I think because the liberty of an individual is at stake is what the kind of rationale behind wearing robes in that scenario is. Um, next slide, please. So the big thorn in the uh, and everyone's side it seemed at one point was whether legal aid was available for this and if it was what kind of legal aid and that is kind of there's more or less been resolved now and it's a, a civil matter dealt with criminally I think is how it's best phrased 
in that criminal legal aid is available because they are strictly speaking criminal proceedings, even if they're being heard in the county court. So there are various other, there are various things you need and Marie's already touched on this. Um, it is very handy if your firm already has a criminal contract and you can continue to deal with the matter. However, if not, you'll need, um, you'll need to have a referral to a criminal practitioner or um, apply by email or through the CCMS for an individual case contract and the corollary criminal representation order, which is the CRM 14 form. And that's the kind of standard form in magistrate's courts. And so it's filling in that form to get the representation order in order to represent the client. Um, these uh, ought to be straightforward, but the individual case contract, I've not advised anyone who's made these. Uh, I've often been working for firms that have both. And so the kind of criteria is set out at the bottom of that slide um, in relation to the interests of justice, substantial involvement in regional proceedings, continuing to act as a representative value for money. Um, I, I'm not going to comment on, on whether that's often easy to be satisfied, but it's it seems that it is a, a very strong arguable case. If you've been dealing with the matter for a long time, you dealt with the injunction itself, and perhaps you're dealing with related possession proceedings of the client, the client trusts you, maybe they have particular vulnerabilities that you're aware of. Um, and so it, I imagine that might be a strong point towards that. And yeah, just a note that cr uh, criminal legal aid is not means tested as well. So um, that's a factor as well. Uh, next slide, please. So your client has been arrested, whether by under 69 or the following a warrant for arrest. Um, what has to happen after the power of arrest has been used is um, that the individual must be brought before a a judge within 24 hours um, and that has various exceptions involving Christmas etc um, but that's a, a, a strict provision and um, is often adhered to. I've been in various magistrates court on Saturday mornings um, <laughs> representing various vulnerable clients uh, who I've been trying to deal with their actual injunction with who then end up getting arrested um, and so at that point when the judge has the client before uh, them they can either deal with it right there and then, which may not be ideal if there's circumstances such as the, the claimant isn't present or the applicant isn't present and you want to gather evidence, or maybe it's the first time you're representing this client, uh, the client self-represented before, and so they've never had the chance to get legal aid, and so now you've been, you're representing them and you can take further evidence, so it wouldn't be appropriate in those circumstances. Um, so they can either deal with the breach or adjourn it and for no more than 28 days. But again, this can be extended and they can renew it on various other occasions. Um, now, the question before the judge, once you've agreed to either, uh, well, if, if you agreed to adjourn, is whether the client should be remanded on bail or in custody. It, I, th I think the difficulty is a lot of uh, judges who, who face these haven't dealt with them before and aren't really sure about the correct guide to follow uh, and so what it is recommended is that the bail act is a rough guide for what it is which talks about the seriousness of the offense uh, and the likely to comply with various conditions such as likely to reoffend or to appear re or to abscond or to um, intimidate witnesses and various other factors that are in the bail act so um, those relevant uh, provisions for your note. I've just moved them somewhere. Um, our schedule one, part one of the Bail Act and paragraph nine. Um, and so it's looking at those points when considering there's a presumption of bail in the criminal court that a similar should apply in uh, the county court as well when dealing with it, particularly where you have a vulnerable client or you have a client who um, has never been in custody before or if there's been an improper power of arrest put on and the only reason for arrest was a noise complaint and um, those are factors that should definitely go against making a remand and a remand order in custody um, and on bail the judge can set any conditions that he or she wishes and um, if you have a client um, who maybe has lax capacity or has other vulnerabilities you can remand to obtain a medical report um, and that's within the Antisocial Behaviour Crime Policing Act itself. Um, this can be really helpful if you've had perhaps uh, an unhelpful report or a report or a report that you think wasn't quite clear on the issue of capacity in relation to compliance with the actual um, injunction. Perhaps you've inherited this case from someone who didn't um, think to put in the brilliant 
a letter to expert that Alice has advised us to do. Um, and so it's really helpful to get another chance to do that and look at that and maybe look at other things that have come up from your conversation with the client or from things that you think that weren't resolved in the initial proceedings. Um, and it's obviously important not to be taking a second bite of the cherry, but it, it may, will in certain circumstances be appropriate to remand in those circumstances. Um, similarly, remand mustn't be for eight clear days unless there's other orders otherwise. And as I said, requirements can be imposed on bail. Uh, next slide, please. I'm very sorry, I'm, I'm going to go over, but you don't have to listen to me. Um, so once uh, the adjournment is over and it's come back before the court, it should be allocated to a circuit judge. And what will happen in effect is there may be some administrative points that need to be dealt with um, or a case management hearing if there's evidence that's come to light or directing witnesses. But at some point there will be then the committal hearing itself. And what the test um, and what we sh must be shown is set out on the slide there. So either you're aware of the terms of the injunction, they acted or failed to act in a manner that breached the injunction, and that the defendant knew of the facts that made the conduct a breach. And um, that's very straightforward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's important to know uh, in this context that if your client doesn't attend, that warrants can be made to secure their, their attendance. But this should not affect their right to silence throughout the whole thing, as in criminal proceedings, the individual has the right to remain silent um, and they should be advised of such. And it should be, in fact, contained within the application if there's an application made. Um, but uh, even if the warrant is ignored by the client, the, a trial can take place in uh, the absence of the defendant. And, and even though this is an exceptional course, the court may go ahead in circumstances where the client is being willfully ignorant and that obviously puts both um, legal representatives, representatives in a difficult position about how you uh, represent your client in that circumstance and uh, that's a whole other conversation. Um, next slide please. So if you're unfortunate and the, you do not resist the committal hearing or uh, the committal uh, application and you are then faced with a situation in which the judge finds true that the client did in fact breach the um, antisocial behaviour injunction, you will then consider sentencing. So there are three sentences available to the um, to the judge in the circumstances and this is under the section 14 of the Contempt of Court Act 1981 and also Rule 81.9. Um, so it's an unlimited fine, so a fine of any amount, uh, a maximum of two year custodial sentence, and that is for an individual uh, for an individual or multiple breaches. It can only be a maximum of two years. This can be suspended or the judge can decide that they make no order. Um, no order is unlikely on the basis that on that except save in exceptional circumstances on the basis that um, the, the court wishes to seek compliance with its um, its orders it's made and that's a very important active point of, uh, of justice. Um, their unlimited fine might also be difficult as well. This is not in the criminal courts where you have a look at people's means and often if it's social housing people maybe have limited means and so uh, on occasion it can also be rare that they do maximum finance so judges feel uh, wrongly, I would say that the only option is a uh, custodial sentence. And obviously, it also doesn't help that um, when you're making an application for contempt, that you are making an application to commit to or for committal, you're making an ap application to commit to jail. That's the phrasing that's used in the uh, guidance or the rules. Uh, and so it can be a maximum of that. So sometimes it can be very short, for example, like two weeks. And it also can be suspended to kind of note the seriousness. Um, and I'll talk about what factors are looked at shortly um, in terms of when looking at that. But in terms of custodial sentence, for those who are familiar with uh, criminal matters, it is also the custodial threshold must also be met, which is a high threshold. It's a serious matter, which warrants the individual being sent to custody. Um, no community order exists and no rehabilitation orders exist. So if you perhaps have a client who's an alcoholic, um, there is no scope to make a rehabilitation order um, for them to attend um, appropriate um, forums to address that behavior and there's no appropriate community order. So it's quite an extreme and archaic um, provision and it's unfortunate that there's still in all the time since this has been passed and in, in the legislative books there's been no consideration of an alternative method there are, i'm sure between everyone on this call there are 
hundreds of clients who could have done well with going uh, to any either of these instead of spending two weeks in prison, which is a horrible experience, which may not even address the offending that the judge is so concerned about addressing. Um, when I was preparing this, I also saw that someone had suggested that you could adjourn. Um, so at the point of sentencing, you could suggest an adjournment and the judge can impose conditions um, and there's liberty to apply to restore the adjournment. So in effect, it's, it's as if it's a suspended sentence almost combined with a community order because you're creating this kind of hybrid situation in which an individual has to comply with certain things or behave in a certain way um, on, with the looming threat that the matter will be restored and they'll be a uh, and they'll be sentenced and um, the judge should make clear what sentence that would be if they're going to make an adjournment um, and say you know I was going to send you to prison but I'm willing to adjourn and see if you um, take uh, heed of your behavior or whatever it is that they believe um, for uh, similarly just to note for no order it'll be maybe in the rare occasion there's a very minor technical breach but again you would question why um, it's being brought in the first place if there's been a very small um, yeah breach and just on the adjournment point sorry the authority for that is George and George um, I can give the authority for that uh, the full citation on another occasion um, next slide please uh, so these are the kind of various guidelines that the court will have to have a look have a look at and um, so breach offenses um, which is the guidance uh, on uh, <laughs> breach offenses and um, it kind of gives the range of um, custodial sentences and gives the factors that increase and um, aggravate or mitigate against uh, what kind of sentence should be had. Um, similarly, the custodial sentences guidelines provided by the custody threshold, um, the guilty plea, th plea threshold. So if your client has pleaded guilty um, and admitted that they've done all those things, then obviously you move straight to sentencing and these guidelines apply often as a third off at first appearance. And um, the totality guidelines, which if there's multiple breaches, how you approach that. Um, and as, as we are aware, the background to all this is that a finding of a breach may give rise to mandatory ground for possession. And so that is often why these, um, these uh, proceedings are brought, because it gives them um, more ammunition to evict uh, a tenant that they don't really like. Um, next slide, please. Uh, costs, you... I think you're entitled to costs uh, if successful as usual, but I think if you're, I don't think you're actually entitled to inter-parties costs. Um, I'm not exactly sure on that. I have to double check because it's the criminal legal aid regime and um, it's slightly different and often um, I'm hoping to get a discontinuous before we get to this point. Um, but the most important thing to warn about is that there's no cost protection under the section 26 of LASPO. And so costs um, should be, if you're unsuccessful party, um, should be resisted as hard as possible for a client who has no means to pay because, or you can obviously put in the same provision that it won't be with the leave, without the leave of the court. And you can put in, in the recitals about the means to pay. And the difficulty with this is often if you're representing a client in current criminal proceedings, you know their means because they filled in various forms to demonstrate that. And you're able to say, um, well, they can't pay this, so they can't pay this. So this is how they can pay this. You can't deduct from benefits in the same way that you can on the criminal court as well. So it's just a bit of a mess. Um, and it's come up a few times in a few uh, recent considerations. Um, and the judge should take a pragmatic approach to it about what is the appropriate thing to do. And so they might say for certain parts that they're more, uh, liable for the costs, or they might adjourn the costs for a couple of months to see what happens. Um, in that matter and so it shouldn't be as routine as ordinarily that the successful party gets the costs um because if your vulnerable client uh, has no means to pay and the court makes an order it can be very serious next slide please and this is my last slide i promise and then we can um be done um do you want to appeal um so if your client is in prison, you don't need permission to appeal. Um, however, if you, and that's rule 52.311, um, and where if they're not in prison, then you will need permission to appeal in, that, in those circumstances. Um, also, you can do what is called purging contempt, um, which is this kind of holy, holy uh, idea 
that you're cleansing yourself of your uh, fault and your uh, disobedience of the court and you say that you're sorry. Um, but it needs to be a lot more than just saying you're sorry. I think historically it could have been sorry and you're right. But um, in modern times, um, what you have to do is admit that you have changed your mind and this is the way you're going to change your behavior. There probably has to be a material change in circumstance really to get out of jail if you're in jail for um, contempt in those circumstances. And so the considerations for the judges, yes, I accept your purge, you're purged. Um, no, I don't accept your purge or not yet. So you, you can always have another go if that doesn't work. Um, and yeah, that's the consideration of that. Um, just to say that appeal from a circuit judge goes to the Court of Appeal. So you're really jumping quite high at the first point. Um, and yeah, and then also you, if you are successful or if circumstances change following the suspended suspension of the commission, uh, committal order, you can vary or discharge the injunction or vary or discharge the order itself if that's an appropriate route to take. Um, there's no more slides. So um, I'll hand back over to Jim. Thanks, Tom. That was, uh, well, what can I say? That, that's our, uh, our new starters, young team who are just amazing. I say, watch out, landlord lawyers, because you're going to get your butt kicked by this lot. Um, as just what one point that Don made at the end there, which is kind of the elephant in the room, which is the uh, mandate, mandatory ground for possession, which is a new thing, relatively new anyway which is uh, increasingly the course of action because during lockdown when the landlord, uh, social landlords couldn't get um, possession of properties, they were seeking injunctions instead. Uh, and then if the clients breach those injunctions, then they'll go for mandatory grounds for possession. And my God, they are difficult to defend. Um, you basically, and, and particularly if your client gets excluded from the property, which happened in one of my cases because, uh, I don't know if Martine's on the line, but basically uh, because the client was excluded, he couldn't get back to show that he was gonna behave. Uh, and that's, in terms of uh, human rights, that's often the only ground. So in terms of proportionality, it's the only way that you can actually avoid a possession, mandatory uh, possession order. So uh, these, these sorts of cases, uh, they're not uh, lucrative. For lawyers because they are generally you don't get cross orders in your favor but they are so important and most you know certainly in, in my time uh clients have said i'd rather go to prison than lose my home uh and, and usually the agenda is to to get rid of them uh by whatever means and and, and generally now it's uh the intention is to go to for the mandatory ground uh, anyway uh we've got a couple of uh vicky's uh, managed to successfully get funding uh, in, I presume that's in a, a committal case, uh, and the um, LAA are looking at uh, the committal rules, which are, are pretty confusing. I, I assume that's what Vicky's talking about. Uh, if not, she can let us know. Uh, and then Simeon has put a question about uh, or, uh, uh, a question about an uh, application for an injunction, which did you want to answer that, Alice? Did you say? Yeah, so there's a question from Simeon there um, about what you do if you've got a return date for an injunction made without notice. And when you get the papers, it's apparent that basically nothing was said to the judge at the without notice hearing about the defendant's potential defence. The judge has basically said, as is often the case, um, I'm satisfied and the papers go away. Now, it is the case that if you're a barrister in those circumstances or an other type of representative, you are meant to, to say, you know, I need to discharge my duty of full and frank disclosure. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm putting in the chat box right now a link to the case that I did earlier this year, which had a sort of a fairly similar circumstance where when we pushed for the note of the hearing, which was the interroot um, case, which Marie's got on her, um, on her slide, we emailed the other side and said, we don't have a note. This is the case that tells us that you have to give it to us. We got a very brief note back, which basically confirms that nothing much was discussed and it was waved through in this kind of way. Um, we went at the, at the return date hearing, I put in a skeleton and we did raise the point of failure to make full and frank. And because it was a short hearing, 
the judge then directed that there be a full hearing of that issue um, as the next port of call. I think you're going to be making an assessment of how serious the failure is and whether it's realistic to expect a discharge of the order off the back of that. And the case, um, the two cases that are on Marie's slide that are really helpful, one is um, the, the case that's covered in this nearly legal article as well, which is where this was applied in the housing context, which was the Barry case from earlier this year, but that also cites inside it the Tugachev case, which sets out the principles that apply in determining whether if, you know, when there's a failure to make full and frank, and then in turn, what happens if a court finds that, and they have a discretion as to whether or not they discharge the injunction that's been made. But in that case that um, I was involved in, we did get it discharged and we got cost and then the whole case actually fell away off the back of that. Um, so I think it's going to always be a question of the specific facts and looking at what wasn't said and how important they are. Um, and thinking about in the round, whether you think it, it is the kind of case that might lead to a discharge. Um, but I would say going to that first return date hearing already have asked the other side for the note because they will not have provided you the note of the without notice hearing. And if they don't, by the time of the hearing, you can make a fuss about that as well. Um, and then, as I say, putting in, getting a skeleton in, setting out the law clearly. And actually, um, there is some commentary. Um, I'll make sure that when we put the slides up online, I, I add just a brief note. There is a report that looked at the courts kind of being too sort of um, casual about all of these requirements. And there was a finding that was negative in that regard. And I put that in the skeleton and that kind of stuff always puts the wind up judges. If you've got like some kind of independent body saying you guys are, you guys are kind of fudging it. So, you know, get that in and then hopefully, I think it's going to depend on the judge you get, to be honest. Some of them are probably going to say, this is how it always happens, go away. But, you know, this is the law and it's how it should be applied. And I think if we don't start making a fuss about the fact that these kind of without notice applications are being made inappropriately, mm -hmm. it will keep happening. So um, I hope that helps, Simeon. But I do think that really, if you, if you go to that link, it, there is a write-up of that case and that, that sets out kind of the detail of what you need to know. Great. And then Jenny says, what sort of positive requirements might be made in a ASB? Any idea? I think from what I understand, I imagine that has more to do with um, ASBs outside of housing. So it'll be when it's the local authority or the police that ask for it. So it'll be things like, and I might be wrong, but I think it'll be things like drug and alcohol rehabilitation. Yeah, that's normally it. That's normally it, I think. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. So there's questions about who would fund it as well. So I just don't think it's something yeah. that a housing a landlord would be asking for. Not usually. I think the lesson is to look, as Alice was saying, just make sure you check the paperwork. I remember a case when uh, a judge uh, had gone through uh, an interim hearing and without notice application. And uh, my client, I came into it late, my client had been put away and he'd served, uh, I don't know, six months or something. And uh, I checked the paperwork and actually there was no grounds. It was it was one of the previous uh, ASBs where they could only be applied for by certain social landlords. And so he'd been wrongfully arrested and in prison. So it's well worth checking all the, um, the paperwork to see what ha what's happened in the past. Is that a lot of judges will just assume that everything they're being told is correct. And a lot of the time it isn't. So anyway, uh, I don't think we've got any other questions, have we? We Can do anyone? have quite a few, Jim, that have popped in. Oh, sorry. Um, Thank I'm you. I'm happy to Vicky. deal with William. William <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, go on. Capacity. Yeah. Um, so the first question from William relates to someone who there was an injunction and they engaged in antisocial behaviour breaching that during a period of relapse and then were sectioned. Um, and then when they came out with an improved state, the original injunction was set aside, um, but then a new injunction was made on the basis of the fact that they had regained capacity. Is that an abusive process? I mean, I, I don't, I think if you look at it discreetly as two sort of separate applications in time, it's right that if an injunction's been made when a person actually lacked capacity, that that should be set aside. I think the second question then is, 
you know, when they're making the new application, what acts are they relying on? And are they now such that you, you're wanting to be resisting that on more substantive grounds rather than technical arguments like abusive process? Like, I think you might be saying, well, those are all acts which occurred when my client was in, you know, a relapsed state and that's not the case anymore and it was X number of years ago or all of those kinds of things as a mean of, means of resistance. Um, I'm not sure... I would need to push on it a little bit more and do a bit of research, but my gut reaction is it's not an abusive process, but there might be good arguments, substantive arguments for resisting an injunction in those circumstances. I can see Jim nodding, which gives me um, comfort. Um, the sec second question from William was- um, oh, Can I just comment on that yeah, as well? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, one of the things that the courts haven't really dealt with in this context is fluctuating capacity as well. Um, mm. I've often had to get addendum reports dealt, dealt with and psychiatric experts are no more limited than we are about it in terms of what it means for the actual practicality. So it's really um, important to ask as well when you're asking your expert, you know, if they have fluctuating capacity, what does that mean in this context? Um, and all the times I've had fluctuating capacity, the claims have been sensible and settled, even with, even with resistance, um, because the reality is that, in my view, it would be unlawful to make an off order in such circumstances. And so um, being really thorough with the instructions can kind of present the this kind of scenario even happening um obviously if they know it's fluctuating and then they maybe go for it maybe that changes whether it's an abusive process I, I don't know but um yeah that's all i would say about that thanks don that's really helpful um the second question from william is about whether or not wookie it can apply on the basis that a person lacked capacity at the time they were engaging in the actions which relied on for the injunction application so it was a relapse they engaged in antisocial behaviour. Um, and then at the time of the application for an injunction, they're no longer you know, in that kind of stage of relapse. Um, my understanding is that Wookie, because of what we said about capacity, it's about a particular matter at a particular time. What's relevant again for the purposes of whether the court can make an injunction is that day. So do they have capacity on the day that the application is being made or heard or all of those kinds of things? And so that the point in time that's relevant for Wookie isn't when the prior acts occurred. But again, in making arguments about whether or not it's just and convenient for an ASB to be made, you might be pointing to the fact that that was at a period of um, ill mental health and that things have moved on and there are good reasons to believe they're stable and so on. Um, but I do, you know, I'm fairly firm on the fact that looking at Wookie, you, you're not looking backwards to previous time, you're looking at their ability to comply with injunction today. Um, there's another question about capacity, but I'm just very aware I'm hogging, but I guess it's a tough area, so. It um, is, and um, that looks like a, a $64 million question, because I never know the answer to this. So I've, maybe you, you have a pop, Alice. This, yeah, this has come up a bit recently, both for me and for Dan, who I share an office with. So we've been talking about it, <laughs> it's tough. So they won't give um, permission to a capacity assessment. Um, I, but you've got concerns that they lack capacity, um, is the first question. Um, I've had cases where this has happened and effectively think the view that we've taken is that there is an obligation to raise with the court the concern about capacity. And what we ended up doing was applying for a closed hearing without the other side, just to determine the issue of capacity where, um, basically the client was able to come and speak to the court and any relevant information was put before the court in terms of they were provided assistance and in, in that you set out like what the law of capacity is and may, may need, maybe any points that raise concerns about capacity but sort of otherwise leave it to the court to decide. You needed to make a decision one way or another. Courts can be quite nervous about making any kind of decision without a report and that's difficult but there is case law suggesting that the court can grasp the nettle. Um, I think there are other potential routes through, but that's certainly something that, depending on the case, I think it can be quite fact specific and you would be wanting to talk to counsel and we'd be arguing about it amongst ourselves in our office to try to do the best. <laughs> in terms of disclosing a report um, about capacity, I think that the approach the OS takes on this, which is probably the right approach, is that um, you, um, the OS generally doesn't like you to disclose the report to the other side or even the certificate about lacking capacity until they kind of got their feet under the table fully. So normally that stage of saying, we need a litigation friend, we need one appointed, please appoint the OS or please appoint whoever you've identified as an appropriate litigation friend. At that stage, I would normally um, 
show the, the court the certificate of capacity that's being prepared by the expert and perhaps if they ask the underlying report but it would not be shared with the other side until the litigation friend is appointed and then you're able to take instructions from them about the disclosure of confidential information because obviously often this is very um highly sensitive personal data governed by the more strict regime under the gdpr so i think it's worth being really cautious about that um and just not you know popping it off to the other side and saying haha <laughs> you know um gotcha so um do be really careful around that the other thing is uh, don't be surprised if uh, the um uh, landlord's barrister or solicitor decides to challenge the psychiatrist report which has happened to me a few times uh and get their own report they want their own report and say uh you know actually doesn't meet the capacity test this report so it's really important that you get um you know the best uh psychiatrist you can i think dr freeman normally <laughs> but she's so busy that uh she um but she's been approved in the higher court so if you can get her that's very good and there's there's various other ones but we should we, we as sort of um tenants solicitors and barristers we should share that information so that people ensure they get the best uh consultant psychiatrist because there, there's good ones and there's bad ones like anything else but anyway i think we've probably reached the end of the questions haven't we Are there any other questions nope well thank you very much uh to our amazing panel what a what a fantastic performance and uh i think somebody asked if the uh, talk would be sent out. Yes, it will be. And um, I think, um, yeah, thanks very much for attending. And um, hopefully we'll see you at our next uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'm not sure what that's on, but uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. And, and thanks very much for coming, everyone. Good night.